again. Good to see you. You take the final one. Okay, I'll take the new one. Well, hi everybody. I'm back, but more importantly, I'm with Nick Candy. And Nick, it's great to have you here in Dubai. Great to have you uh, with us for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And I'm going to begin by asking you to just uh, go back a little bit. We have just heard you described as the, the king of the idea of branded residence. And it's interesting that you're described that way, given that we've also heard that London isn't really where this marketplace is at its most vibrant, its biggest. So I want you to go back to uh, the period between the 90s when you and your brother first started working in property in London and that big decision, I guess it was 2004, 2005, to put your money into this amazing piece of real estate uh, overlooking Hyde Park. You made a decision to build some, to develop something new. What was the thinking behind you going in for one Hyde Park? Well, it seems a long time ago now, but it was uh, 2004. It was a wet November day. And there was a building called Bowater House where One High Park is today. It was an ugly 1970s office building, but it was a great location. It was at the end of Sloan Street. You could see it from Sloan Square. It was a beautiful building. Uh, well, not ugly building, but beautiful location. And I remember speaking to my brother. And he was about to exchange contracts to purchase it. And... He, like we were paying 150 million pounds for this site and everyone said we were mental. <laughs> okay, it was off market. The people selling it was the largest public real estate company in the UK, Land Securities, and in their books it was 90 million pounds. So we were giving them a 60 million pounds profit. But I've never cared what somebody else makes. It makes no difference to me whatsoever. I don't get concerned about what their profit is, how they make it, whatever. So I was happy for them. And we bought this building for 150 million pounds. Uh, I, went to, I went into Hyde Park, and there's a rule in um, London that if you can see above the tree line, you can't build any higher than that. So when you look back at the building. So I looked at this building, it was pissing with rain, excuse my language, and, um, and I looked at it and I was like, Christian, it's gonna be phenomenal. We should do it. And so he exchanged contracts. We put all the architectural plans that uh, Land Security PLC had done in the shredder. They yeah. were gone. Uh, the reason why every time they'd been back to see the planners, they cut a bit off the building here, a bit off the building there. So it was an imperfect building in lots of ways. And we hired Richard Rogers, who's sadly passed away now, to be our architect. And I remember sitting down with him, um, uh, sketching what I wanted it to be like with him. And we like all great architectural buildings, you can normally draw it in about three to four lines and Richard Rogers designed a building. We got planning permission in 12 months for it, and we revalued the building 18 months after buying it for 540 million pounds. Yeah. Okay, and then we sold 85 apartments for two billion sterling between you, you years. You took one yourself, right? I, I have a penthouse store there. You still do? Yeah, I, I'm, I find it difficult to let go of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I can understand It's like a baby. Why. I can understand why. Now, the thing is, you, as you said, you worked with Richard Rogers. Uh, I think you worked with Meridian Hotel next door, right? In terms uh, Man of Mandarin Oriental. Right Mandarin, right. Who's one of the great hotel brands in the world. Exactly, and they're right next door. And, and it was something new in London, and it caused a huge stir, and people were writing about it and filming it, and da-da-da. Did you know from the very get-go this was an idea that was absolutely not just going to work in its location, but was then going to be, for your company, rolled out you know, around the world? I could feel it, but you never really know, because you need lots of things to align. So London at that time was full of international money from Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, India, China. The, the money was coming in, and you're having the same thing happen in the UAE as we speak. Okay? London, it was a time and a place, and we like all things in life, you need a bit of luck, you need some destiny and a bit of fate. And those things aligned for us at that time. If you ask me to build one high park in London today, it is impossible. Really? First of all, you can't build a flat bigger than 2,500 square feet inside the city of Westminster. It, it is illegal. If you and I have two flats next to each other of 2,500 square feet, I don't want to, want to create one flat of 5,000 square mm. feet, illegal. The funds, the construction funds wouldn't, wouldn't be there. The construction companies wouldn't be there. So Dubai, the UAE, Saudi, they're in a different place today. Um, and so I think, you know, Dubai is not just, you know, you know, a great city in the Middle East. Dubai is probably maybe the global city of the world today. 
So you're extremely interested in putting more of your investments in yep. this region? 100%. Yeah. You'll, you'll see over the next few months a lot of announcements. Really? Just going back to your, your clientele, your customers, you described how at that particular time you were selling uh, to extraordinarily rich people, many of them from the former Soviet Union space, I dare say many of them also from Asia. Uh, it's a very particular sort of marketplace. How would you describe your sort of reach out to those ultra, ultra rich people? What do you have to do to make them convinced that your project is the one that they need to invest in? Well, in terms of, I call it the candy layering effect. Why, why do we get the prices that other people can't get? So, and why do we get the clients because of those prices? So, if you've got an inferior location to me, I can charge more money for my location. Probably 5%, 10%. If I've got a better architect than you, I can charge a better, a better premium. If I've got a better hospitality provider, if I've got a better interior designer, if, I've got, if I'm building better quality. So, we, we call it the layering effect to get to a price. And then, we know wealthy people across the world want the very best. Okay? There's plenty of money in the world. Okay? We just got, you've got to find it, but they don't want second best. And so when I've listened to some of the speeches here today, and the, you know, th these branded residences with no service provider, no hospitality, they're not branded residences. They're residences. Hmm. Okay, so I, I believe, you know... So, somebody said earlier that they think the, the whole sort of concept, the phrase branded residence has become devalued. Do you think it has? Yeah, it's like luxury here. Every, everyone's building luxury, apparently. So, I mean, everyone's building branded residences and everyone's building luxury. So, what's the difference? Right. There is no difference. There is a difference. The, the people that know, know. So, I'll give you some examples. If Mandarin Oriental built a watch today, okay, would you buy it? Okay. If Mandarin Oriental built a car today to compete with Mercedes, would you buy it? So, why are people buying watch brands, residences, car brands, residences? What does it mean? For me, it means nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I call, it, I call it the fake handbag. But, but as you, as, as, as the member of the audience uh, called Nick Candy, just said a few moments ago in the previous panel, you know, even rich people care about money. I said it. You, that's what I'm saying. You said that when you were an audience member. Now you're up here with me. So if even rich people care about money, do you think that, that you know, the premium, for example, that you can uh, demand because of the reputation you've got and the history you've got, do you think you're, you're sort of uh, close to the edge? I mean, how far can these premiums go? No. Let's just take Dubai, for example. Dubai is, at the top end on the beach, is probably 5,000 US dollars a square foot. And it may be in the main city of Dubai near DFC uh, and that area is maybe two and a half to 3,000 dollars a square foot. Now, for Dubai, that seems expensive because it, it, there's been huge growth since COVID, since the Ukraine-Russian war. But on a global level, it's cheap. Now, has Dubai built the best quality ever seen in the world yet? I don't believe so. Has it got the ability to do so? 100%. Is that where you think you're coming in? Hopefully. Improve the quality? Yeah, so that, 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 that's what I, I, what's my specialist is. I've got serious OCD. I spend more money on residences than most people could dream of. My personal home in Chelsea, I spent more money than it cost me to buy the house to redo it. So, so we're talking absurd level of detail here, attention to detail. Yes. You, you, you go into everything. Absolutely everything. Every single floor plan, even the cloakroom, even the cupboards. I want to know everything. Uh, I'm beginning to think one of the worst jobs in the world must be being somebody delivering one of your projects. Because yes. I can imagine when you visit, <laughs> when you visit, it must just be the most stressful experience. Yeah, it's challenging. But to be the very best, if you're the greatest tennis player that ever has played tennis, or the greatest golf player, or you know, you 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 put a huge amount of effort into getting to that place. We do that, and I'm not embarrassed of that. I have serious OCD, which is a problem for some people, but it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we had your friends and family here, we could discuss yeah, it with them, but yeah. but we don't, no, so you're okay. Um, it's already clear your excitement, your passion for doing more in Dubai. That is shining through already. 
there's been a lot of talk at this conference of, of Saudi Arabia and, you know, opportunities there, the degree to which the kingdom is changing and the degree to which it's going to be open to international investment. Uh, what's your view on Saudi Arabia? Listen, we are doing one project in Saudi Arabia. Interestingly enough, it's not branded residences. Uh, we have a new model on something which I truly think will change the, the world for the uber rich. Uh, I can't tell you what it is today, but we'll be... A, a, sorry, a new model of selling? No, a new model of doing something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't say what it is well, today. You, you, I, I'm, uh, I'm slightly <laughs> lost here. Just give me more of a clue of what you're talking about, because I'm not entirely Experiences clear. Experiences for the super rich. Experiences for the super rich. And you're now looking at something along those lines in Saudi. Yes. And we'll do one in Dubai and probably one in Abu Dhabi. Right. You, and you mean you will be developing a, a, a site which will be both residential but experiential? Yes. We are working on something in Diria Gate in uh, Riyadh with the uh, Saudi government. Uh, it's not signed yet, but we're, I'm sure it will get signed hopefully before the end of the year. Mm. Where else in the world excites you? Not the West. Um, I think uh, we've destroyed our value system in the West. I've said before here in Dubai, I think the values we once cherished in the West uh, you're more likely to find them here in Dubai and the Middle East. I think the leadership here in this part of the world is, I, I pray for leadership like you guys have got. Uh, I think. I, I sense you're veering into politics here, which, well, uh, the, the, as a journalist, I'm very well, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. But, uh, what but no, I, I genuinely like, I've got two young kids at, you know, 10 and 7, uh, and the values that I grew up with growing up in London and in Surrey, they just aren't there today, and that upsets me. Are you thinking of leaving London? I spend every other week here in Dubai already. Oh. But, I mean, you've got a young family. I mean, how, how close to cutting your ties with London are you? Listen, I'm a Londoner. I love London. I still think London's one of the greatest cities in the world. I'll always have a home there. I love my little home in the Cotswolds as well. I think it's an incredible part of the world. And most of the senior leadership here will have homes in the UK as well. So. Uh, am I ready to go tomorrow? No, but could I go soon? Yes. And I think the idea that all these non-doms that we're throwing out of London, they're all going to come here, or Switzerland or Monaco. The biggest benefactor of this non-dom thing will be the UAE, 100%. And the UK, we're going to swap that incredible talent, that amazing talent of incredible individuals. They're going to leave and they won't come back because COVID made wealth mobile. You don't need to be in your home the whole time. Mm. And just, in fact, while we're on the subject of sort of um, offices and stuff, one of the big things I think will happen next is not branded residences, but branded offices. So um, at One High Park, because I wasn't married when I did One High Park, I didn't have kids, um, I thought they would just come down to the library downstairs in a few meeting rooms, and if they wanted to get away from their apartment, they could just pop downstairs see their banker or their lawyer or whatever and have a meeting downstairs. Mm. I got that wrong. I also didn't really develop any space for the children. We, we, we had teenage rooms with like driving games and screens and um, golf simulators and all that. But for the young kids, soft play and stuff, I didn't put that in because I, I didn't understand it. So today, if I was building a new brand of residences, I'd have a proper area for kids of all ages. Uh, and I would also do a branded office area so where you'd have a beautiful reception area with coffee bar and champagne bar, whatever, but also you could have your own, lots of meeting rooms, but you could also take your own space from 1,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet and take your own space. And I think you'll see the top brands in the world go into branded offices. And just a, a final thought, which, you know, sort of come out of the conversation that happened just before us, that there is some concern that, you know, the level of, of luxury um, and service that is being offered comes with a price where even the ultra-rich are beginning to bulk at service to ongoing service charges, which are just becoming eye-watering. Do you, do you think that's a non-issue or is it No, I think it's an issue. I said even rich people care about money, yeah. uh, and I stand by that comment. Um, I think that there's many ways in the, in the era of technology we can deal with um, so let's call it facilities management, okay? The largest chunk of service charge is people, whether we mean the cost. It's, a, it's normally a people's cost. It's not, it's not you know, the, the chlorine for the swimming pool or whatever. It's the, it's the people cost. And I think a lot of that can be done uh, through 
let's just say it's windows and you've got a tower which is, tower which is 300 meters high. Why can't drones clean those windows robotically? They can. Mm. And what developers aren't doing and what we are doing, we are speaking immediately up front now, because I've made the mistakes, I've had the pitfalls, I've fallen into them, is we are speaking with those facilities management companies to work out w which way and how can we get those costs down to as low as possible. Final thought, you, you and your brother have made a lot of money. I mean, you don't really need to work anymore. Of course you don't. But it seems the passion burns bright in you. Are you as absolutely committed you know, to property development building now as you were when you were that young man you know, in the mid-90s setting out? I would say I'm more committed. More? Yeah. I, I, I think two reasons. One is having children. I want to leave a legacy. Um, and number two, most successful people have a big chip on their shoulder, and I've got a big chip on my shoulder, <laughs> okay? And uh, I've got something to prove. Well, what okay. is that chip? What's that chip all about? I mean, we're running out of time, so we're going into a bit of psychotherapy here, but what's that chip all about? It's a bit about? early for the day for that. <laughs> so uh, I, I think, um, I don't know, I, I want to prove people wrong. I want to prove the doubters wrong. And if you're a visionary and you think you can see how the future looks, uh, and I believe, I, for, I don't know mid-market, I don't know low-market, so, but I do understand how the uber-rich live and want to live. And if you're a visionary and you're trying to sell that vision, then you have to deliver it. And my job is to deliver it. It's fascinating. Nick Candy, thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Nick, we've got to get off the stage. There's lots more to come, but uh, once again, Nick, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.